In the spring of 1993, an unexplained illness struck the residents of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. 400,000 people developed serious gastrointestinal illness. 4,000 were hospitalized, and by the time it was under control, more than 100 people died. Health officials suspected it was influenza, but it was something more serious and much more difficult for medical detectives to uncover. the 17th largest city in the United States, with a population of almost one million people. It's a city known for its German culture, summer festivals, and long, cold winters with plenty of snow. Milwaukee is the home of several large breweries, producing 11 million barrels of beer annually. But in the spring of 1993, Milwaukee became famous for something else, an unexplained outbreak of gastrointestinal illness which spread rapidly throughout the community. 4,000 people rushed to area hospitals, all with the same symptoms, severe cramps, diarrhea, nausea, and fever. I had the diarrhea off and on all week. I missed two days of work, and I thought it was gone, and it came back again. Hardest hit were individuals with weakened immune systems, infants, the elderly, cancer and AIDS patients, and those who had organ or bone marrow transplants. Four-year-old Becky Furman suffered from a particularly bad case. She was just a vibrant child. She demanded the center of attention, but <laughs> we gave it to her willingly. Uh, but very healthy kid. When, once she caught up on, on the normal things that infants do, um, she just went with it. She was highly intelligent, very vivacious, very talkative, very friendly, um, just a normal kid. Becky Furman was born HIV positive, which made her particularly susceptible to the mysterious outbreak. This got to be absolute water, turning from brown to yellow to green. Terrible odor. And she would have 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, bowel movements a day. 40-year-old Antonio Claudio was also affected. Like Becky, he too is HIV positive, but the severity of the cramps and diarrhea he developed during the outbreak was alarming. Yeah, I freaked out. <laughs> I was like, is, is this, 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 what's happening to me, a nature of course of the virus itself, of the HIV AIDS? Or is this something else? The illness spread rapidly throughout Milwaukee. Pharmacies ran out of anti-diarrheal medicine. Schools were closed. And absenteeism was at record levels in the business community. Marilyn Marchione covered the outbreak for the Milwaukee Journal newspaper. For us at the paper, it was like uh, having a serial killer loose for a medical reporter because there was a lot of confusion. Uh, not a lot of information about what could be causing the outbreak. People were calling alarmed and concerned. The primary suspects were Shigella, Giardia, Campylobacter, or Salmonella, common bacteria and parasites which cause these symptoms. But stool samples from the infected individuals were all negative. We knew this was big. I mean, we knew a lot of people were sick. We knew a lot of kids were sick. We were beginning to get reports from hospitals that patients, particularly with immune compromising conditions, particularly HIV AIDS, were having very difficult times shaking loose of this outbreak. And so we were uh, beginning to understand that this was in fact an epidemic. And health officials had no idea what was causing it. Within 24 hours of the outbreak, the mayor of Milwaukee knew he faced a serious dilemma. No American city had ever faced this type of crisis before. The concern in the health department was the beginning of, you know, a real concern. What is this? 
You know, how can so many people get sick all at one time? City Health Commissioner Paul Nannis learned that stool samples from the sick patients were all negative. He had no scientific leads. Knowing that for an outbreak of this size, as we were recognizing, it was certainly large, it would have either had to be food, water, or air. There's no other common connector or vector that would have had occasion to um, um, make so many people sick all at once. If the outbreak was caused by a contaminated food source, stool samples would contain the bacteria which caused it. And health officials could find no common food source that all of the sick individuals used. Food illnesses usually center around a common food distribution center, processing plant, restaurant, or grocery store. But one common element among all of the infected individuals was water. Officials analyzed the water quality records at the city's municipal water supply. But all of the water quality levels were within guidelines established by the Environmental Protection Agency for safe drinking water. Everything that we saw told us that our process was working real well and that we were meeting all those state and federal mandates. We went back and indicated that to the health department and they continued on with their investigation into other areas. The only remaining element common among the infected individuals was the air. We had initially suspected that perhaps it was some kind of fast-acting airborne virus that might be out there because it was in fact flu season. But when scientists looked at the distribution pattern of the outbreak, they noticed that most of the cases were clustered in the south side of the city. We believe we would have witnessed a more normal, uniform distribution of illness had it been an airborne virus, because it would have started at a point and moved outward. Since the outbreak seemed to be centered in Milwaukee's south side, this narrowed the focus of the investigation. Becky Furman lived on Milwaukee's south side. Her doctors had no idea what caused her illness and soon discovered they couldn't cure it in individuals like Becky who had HIV. One of the things was that she was limited in what she could do as far as where we could go and what we could do with her as far as playing because she would have these accidents. Another thing was the general weakness uh, because of the constant diarrhea. Gastrointestinal illness is usually caused by something that is ingested, once again pointing to food or water. Due to the widespread nature, uh, it would be very difficult for a single food to be incriminated in such a widespread nature of illness in a community, uh, whereas water gets to a lot more people uh, a lot quicker and on a more, much more widespread basis than uh, you'd expect a single food item. The water plant which supplied Milwaukee's south side reported that the only unusual readout was a peak in turbidity one week before the outbreak. Turbidity measures the amount of foreign particles in the water. After a rainstorm or when snow melts, turbidity levels will temporarily rise. Storms churn river and creek bottoms, and melting snow will often gather particles as it runs into streams. Health officials wondered if the increase in turbidity levels was cause for concern. The municipal water supply was disinfected with chlorine. Was it possible that the city's water supply was contaminated with something that didn't show up in water tests? and that chlorine would not kill. If so, the entire city would be at risk, and one of the city's largest industries could also be affected, the brewing industry. The breweries were among the largest users of municipal water. If there was an unknown organism in the water, was it being shipped all across the country by the tens of thousands of gallons a day. Health officials suspected that something in Milwaukee's water supply was causing the outbreak of thousands of cases of gastrointestinal illness. The water department insisted that the water quality levels were all within standards set by the Environmental Protection Agency and that the water was safe to drink. 
Hospitals and laboratories throughout Milwaukee continue to analyze stool samples from the thousands of individuals affected. Everything pretty much was a dead end. Everywhere we looked, was everything was negative. Sandy Schraderis was doing some of those tests at a local hospital. As a microbiologist, she was performing the routine tests on patients hospitalized with the mysterious illness. The standard test was an iodine stain. When added to the stool samples, the iodine would show if parasites were present. But all of the iodine tests were negative. On her own, Sandy Schraderus decided to go one step further. She remembered something she learned earlier in her training, that microbiologists should be on the lookout for parasites which do not show up on standard tests. With that in mind, she noticed a number of unusual structures in the samples, structures which didn't react with the iodine stain. At that point, I knew, and again, it's, it's more of a feeling after so many years that this means something. That's more or less what I get. This can't be artifact. I don't know exactly what it is yet, but it means something. That's your first clue. So she performed an acid fast stain. She flooded the stool sample with a red stain, then washed the sample with alcohol and sulfuric acid. During the final step, an additional green stain is added under the microscope. She thought she saw a highly infectious, potentially deadly parasite. First acid fast stain wasn't real definitive. This is probably our first line. It's easiest, it's quickest, it's done in about 10 minutes. And I didn't feel comfortable calling it on that, so we went on and did a fluorescent stain. The fluorescent stain introduces the parasite's antibody to the sample, along with a fluorescent agent. Under the microscope, Sandy Schraderus noticed a bright green glow. It was the fluorescent agent attached to the antibody, proof that a parasite was present. It was Cryptosporidium. Little is known about Cryptosporidium since it first infected humans just over 20 years ago. It's a one-celled organism, a protozoan parasite, which is found in feces from young farm animals, particularly calves. Cryptosporidium is an 80% of surface water, largely due to animal feces washed from farms into nearby streams by heavy rains and melting snow. When contaminated water is ingested by humans, the cryptosporidia are in small shells called oocysts. They attach themselves to the intestines and sometimes the gallbladder. Here you can see the tiny cryptosporidia escaping from their shells. Once they do, they multiply by the millions. When they spread throughout the gastrointestinal system, they absorb nourishment, preventing the body from retaining fluids and causing severe cramps, explosive diarrhea, and other flu-like symptoms. A healthy individual with a healthy immune system can usually get rid of the parasite within a week with no lasting effects. But it can be deadly for those with weakened immune systems like the elderly, AIDS and cancer patients, and individuals with organ and bone marrow transplants. When lab technicians retested other stool samples, they confirmed what Sandy Schraderus first discovered. Cryptosporidium was found in seven more stool samples. Once you knew what you're looking for, it was everywhere. I mean, we knew then. Now we had the agent. Now where was it coming from? That was the next step. Since Cryptosporidium is a waterborne parasite, it renewed fears that the city's water supply was contaminated. The mayor called an emergency meeting of both city and state health officials. During that meeting, the mayor noticed one of the participants, Dr. Jeffrey Davis, the state's epidemiologist, was drinking diet soda and not water. When the mayor turned to Dr. Davis and asked if he would drink the city's water, Dr. Davis said, no. It wasn't difficult once I asked Dr. Davis if he'd drink the water. I mean, if he suspected, he's a scientist, he's an expert, and, and a very honest person. Uh, 
you know, if he suspected that there could be problems with the water, that's a pretty good test right there. Since boiling was the only way to get rid of cryptosporidium, the mayor immediately issued a boil water advisory recommending that all water be boiled for at least five minutes before use. It was a bold recommendation with wide-ranging implications since tests for cryptosporidium in the city's water supply had not yet been completed. Dental offices were closed since their drills were water-cooled. Restaurants were also affected since they use water for ice and washing dishes. Three days later, tests on Milwaukee's water done by an independent laboratory confirmed that cryptosporidium was present in the purified water from the Howard Avenue water plant. The news of cryptosporidium contamination was especially terrifying to one segment of the population, people with HIV infections or AIDS. For these patients, it was life-threatening immediately. They knew what crypto was. This was not a new illness to them. It was something they dreaded that they'd maybe heard or seen in friends from around the country, and they knew exactly how serious it was for them. Cryptosporidiosis for someone with a severely compromised immune system is a death sentence. Doug Nelson and the organization he directs, the AIDS Resource Center of Wisconsin, went into crisis mode. He knew that individuals with HIV AIDS would never get rid of the parasite, but his goal was to make sure no one else became infected. When the local breweries learned about the parasite in the water, they had no concerns about their product. The breweries had their own water purification process, which included boiling the water before brewing. This would have eliminated cryptosporidium and any other parasites. The Miller Brewing Company made available to the public emergency supplies of purified water as a gesture of goodwill to the community. The Howard Avenue water plant was immediately closed. The water flushed out and the entire plant disinfected from top to bottom to remove any traces of cryptosporidium. A few days after the boil water advisory, the number of cryptosporidiosis cases dropped significantly, but the levels discovered in Milwaukee's water supply had been potent. One businessman traveling through Milwaukee's airport reported getting sick after drinking just enough water to swallow a few aspirin. Antonio Claudio was living in Houston when he tested positive for cryptosporidiosis. He believes he was infected while visiting his mother who lived on the south side of Milwaukee. Since there is no cure for cryptosporidiosis besides a healthy immune system, Antonio lives each day with constant chronic diarrhea. Once you discover you have this disease, your own life changes and there's just no way to get around it. Prayer helps a lot, but um, you just can't erase it. It's reality, no matter what portion of it, and you're just waiting to die. Little Becky Furman lost her fight with cryptosporidiosis. She died after battling its effects for many months. Becky was in a coma, eyes closed but she raised her hands to us and grabbed hold of our hands, took three breaths, and, and a spirit and energy left. Ripped the heart. Um, but a gratefulness, because she wasn't in pain anymore. She looked peaceful for the first time. Investigators soon had a theory for how cryptosporidium contaminated Milwaukee's water supply. After an intensive investigation, health officials developed a theory as to how cryptosporidium contaminated Milwaukee's water supply. In early April of 1993, heavy rains and the spring snow melt caused water runoff. The ground was still frozen and unable to absorb the water. Manure from the farms and fields might have washed into nearby streams, manure which contained cryptosporidium. The cryptosporidia then made their way from the streams into Lake Michigan, the source of Milwaukee's drinking water. Shortly before the outbreak, 
wind and water currents were in a southwesterly direction, pushing the water south towards the Howard Avenue water plant, which served the south side of Milwaukee, and away from the Linwood water plant, serving the city's north side. In 1993, there were no filters or mass disinfectants used anywhere in the United States, which could eliminate the cryptosporidium in water plants. Chlorine was ineffective against it. Over 400,000 people who ingested water from the Howard Avenue plant became ill. 4,000 were hospitalized. 104 died. That theory held for four years. During that time, the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, Georgia, continued to investigate Milwaukee's cryptosporidium outbreak, since it was the largest waterborne outbreak in United States history. In 1997, scientists retested four stool samples from individuals infected during that outbreak. They conducted DNA testing on the cryptosporidium, and when they did, there was a shocking discovery. The type of cryptosporidium found in the four stool samples from the Milwaukee outbreak did not come from farm animals. It was a new strain, one which came from human waste. Our results suggest on the basis of the limited number of samples that we looked at that the uh, Milwaukee outbreak um, was, was not from pasture runoff but was from uh, sewage contamination. When investigators looked more closely at Milwaukee's water supply, they found that the Howard Avenue water plant's intake was less than two miles down current from a sewage treatment plant overflow valve in Lake Michigan. The CDC's discovery suggested that human waste containing cryptosporidium was released from the sewage treatment plant, traveled the two miles downstream, where it entered the water intake of the Howard Avenue water plant. Today, sewage from that plant is no longer released into Lake Michigan, and the Howard Avenue water plant moved their intake further out into the lake, away from possible pollutants. And Milwaukee is building an ozonization facility. Ozone is a form of oxygen, which kills more microorganisms than chlorine. It's the only mass disinfectant process known to kill cryptosporidium in water. When the facility is completed, Milwaukee will be the only major city in the United States to ozonate its water. Since 80% of surface water contains cryptosporidium, Milwaukee health officials believe it is an expensive but necessary step.